Well, if you were this morning, normally I'm preaching through the book of Ephesians and didn't preach through it last week because we had a baptismal service, and so I kind of altered the message uh, last week for uh, that particular special occasion, which we're glad to have those kind of alterations sometimes. But we've been preaching through the book of Ephesians and gotten down into the section that deals with the family relationships and what that is supposed to look like in the Christian home. And, and I was supposed to be preaching, or at least if I was continuing doing it this again this morning, about fathers and raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But before I do that, I thought I wanted to talk about one more time about what a Christian man is to look like. So I want you to I want you to turn to the book of the First Corinthians, First Corinthians this morning, and chat in verses thirteen and fourteen. First Corinthians verses thirteen and fourteen. And the apostle Paul writes here: Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. So what I'm going to talk about this morning, before I get to talk again, I will, Lord willing, speak about the fathers next week. I want to talk about the five characteristics of biblical manhood. The five characteristics of biblical manhood. Now I do believe that in this particular verse is that Paul is speaking particularly to men because the word that he uses down there, act like men, is not the generic man when we're talking about mankind. But it is in the Greek the word that is used for men, for males of the species. And yes, I do believe that there are only two genders, male and female, as God created them. And so there is a distinction here, and I do believe that this is applying that Paul is really speaking particularly here to men. And so this is, I'm saying this because somehow the idea of being a man and being a Christian sometimes in some, in in our culture in one way, don't go together. That necessarily if you're a Christian man, you're some kind of a wimp. Uh, That to be a man, you've got to cuss, you've got to drink. You gotta be a womanizer. You gotta carouse around. And that's in one segment of society what they think that a man is. But we as Christians, as Christian men, are supposed to be the ultimate example of what God defines as a man in the scriptures. And fathers need to be this, husbands need to be this. When we look at men in biblical history, there are very much, I would say, manly men, Christian men, men that loved the Lord and exemplified that. We look at men such as Abraham. We look at men such as Moses. We look at men such as Joshua and Caleb and David and Nehemiah and on and on. And then there are more men in modern history such as, yes, Robert E. Lee. Stonewall Jackson that were stalwart Christian men. The reformers, you look at these, they were men in every sense of the word, the martyrs. And so these men are real men in every sense of the word, both in the spiritual and the physical realm. Now, there is an attack in this particular day and time upon Christian manhood. And I want to talk about that in this particular message. But the modern church and our families and society at large needs the example of Christian manhood men. In these two verses, what Paul is teaching are five characteristics that exemplify what Christian manhood is all about in the spiritual and, I believe, the physical realm and what our responsibilities are, at least in some respects, in these realms. So before we go to Ephesians 6 and 4 and talk about Christian fathers, we're going to talk about Christian manhood. First of all, the Apostle Paul says here, be watchful. So the first characteristic is watchfulness. And then what he means here is what he's emphasizing here in this 
is that these, these words here, I want to say this, that these words here are in what we call in the original language, in the original writings, by the way, that the original writings were not in English. They were in the Greek and the Hebrew. And the word here is in what we call the present imperative. Now, there's, I explained this last week. There's the, the imperative it always speaks of a command. And there's the present, which means an ongoing thing. It is a continuous obedience. There's an aorist imperative that means a one-time type of thing, like we talked about last week about baptism, that there is to be a one-time fulfillment of that. It's a command, you do this, but you don't do it again. But what we have emphasized here is this continuous thing, to have this sense of watchfulness as Christian men. And so this speaks to what God intended to be, and which I believe are to be the providers and the protectors of our homes. And some would say, well, isn't that an archaic idea? I believe that it is a biblical idea that we need to reassert. But this is what God designed us to be. Now, you remember in the creation in Genesis 1 and 28, what does that say there? What did God say there? He said, to have dominion. So one who has dominion is one who is a provider. He is a protector. And even in our very beings, God has made distinctions. God designed men with a different genetic, physiologic, biological, mental, and emotional makeup. And it has been that way since the creation. And suddenly, we know in this day and time that there are many that wanted to to redefine what gender is and to say that gender can be whatever you decide whatever it is, which is, let me say this with all graciousness and I can say it is scientifically deniable. It is not supported by the science. It's not supported by scripture. It's not supported by biology. And therefore, it is a ludicrous and moronic idea to deny this, that this is how God has created. There are differences in it, in us. And the behavior, we look at, okay, we've got lots of kids in the church now. We used to only have like one. (laughs) And he's about two now. But we can see the differences as evidenced even in our own congregation. There's a difference in the emotional makeup and demeanor, the physical makeup and demeanor of little boys and little girls. I don't have to go out there and teach little boys how to take a stick and make it into a gun. We don't have to teach little girls how to be feminine because that is part of the imprint that God has made upon them. We should celebrate our manhood men. And ladies, you should celebrate your femininity. I'm not getting a lot of amens on that, man. All right. Amen. Amen. All right. This is what God has created us to be. But as Paul is speaking here, there is, as he's pointing out here, there's a, there is something that we as Christian men are uniquely created for. We've talked about this, that the husband is the head of the wife. And that's not because of sin. That mandate was given, that order was given as we pointed out in 1 Timothy. That that this is the man, the husband is the head of the wife because in the original creation order, that is how he designed it. And he has designed us to be a protector over our home. And we need to be. And we see it in scripture of this watchfulness that God has created. And he's created it even, and we had the examples there of men in the scriptures that were watchful, that exhibited this type of behavior. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verses 34 and th- through 35, you remember this is the story of David and Goliath. And David said, why are you allowing this uncircumcised Philistine to go out here and mock our God? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to basically take him down. Or take him out, as we would say in this day and time. And they were, oh, you're just a lad. And he says, listen, David said to Saul, your servant was shepherding his father's sheep. And a lion and a bear would come and take a lamb from the flock and I would go out after it and strike it and rescue the lamb from its mouth. Then it rose up against me. What did I do? Did he run? No. He says, I would seize it by its beard and strike it down and put it to death. That's a pretty good feat. (laughs) I'm not sure I would take that on. But David, how did he know that the lamb, how did he know that the sheep had been stolen from the flock because he was being watchful for the predators? As Christian men, our calling is to be watchful for the predators. The spiritual predators that prey upon our wives and our children. He knew that. As men, we are to be watchful, especially as husbands and fathers. We're to be watchmen upon the walls as it is spoken of in Isaiah 62 and 6 which says on your walls of Jerusalem I have appointed watchmen, men, husbands, fathers. You are the watchman over your home. You are the protector of your children and your wife, your family. This is your calling. This is your appointment by God. And Paul is saying, men, be watchful. I was reminded of John 10 as Jesus spoke of the parable, or not the parable, but speaking of him as the good shepherd and the sheep. And he talked about in that that the the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. But the shepherd had in that particular day, and I've taught on this before, when I taught in in John, he would take the, the sheep out during the day, and they would graze upon the green pasture. If you're familiar with Psalm 23, he leads me beside the still waters. He makes me to lie down in what? Green pastures. David did. But Jesus said that the shepherd watches the sheep. The shepherd is tending to the sheep. He is caring for the sheep. There And if, if you have a false shepherd, if you have someone that is not a shepherd, when he sees danger coming, he runs. But the faithful shepherd, and I would say this, the faithful husband and the faithful follower is always attentive to the spiritual dangers upon his family. This is what he is watching for. And if someone comes, and as we saw the parable of the 90 and 9 sheep, but the shepherd goes out and finds the one lost sheep, the reason he went out to find the one lost sheep is he is watching, and he notices it is missing, and he goes out and he finds the sheep, and he retrieves it. And Maybe somewhere along the way he had to slay a lion or a bear or a thief. And so husbands and fathers, guess as I said, we are the watchmen. We are set upon the walls to look for the impending danger. We have that responsibility as Christian men. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6 tells us, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and sober. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring, lying lion seeking someone to devour. The lion that is after our homes and our families is the devil himself. He is after, if he can't get us, he's after the souls of our wives and our children. And as he spoke here to be not asleep, I fear that many so-called Christian men are asleep in this day. That while the enemy is slipping in through the eye gate, through the ear gate, that we're asleep. That we're not watching what 
at what the prey, what, what the lion is bringing into our homes. Our double responsibility as fathers and husbands is to protect our families not only in the world, but from the world. The world and Satan has no interest in the spiritual well-being of your wife and your children. He wants to take every single one of them to hell. That is what he desires. And God has set us up as husbands upon the walls to be watching for the spiritual dangers. We can't be dozing in front of the TV. We can't be so enraptured in our computers and our cell phones that we are oblivious to what is coming into our homes and into the minds of our wives and our children. Sometimes the house cleaning in regards to those things, the first thing that needs to happen is confession of sin on our own parts. That we have allowed those things. We are participating in those things. We are opening the door for Satan himself to come into our homes. And we've just said welcome. We need to slam the door, kick him out, and begin anew to be protecting, to be watchful for our homes. There is a flood of worldly, secular, demonic philosophy that has come into this world like a ravenous predator. And it is our responsibility as the watcher, the sentry upon the wall of our homes and families to protect them. To do this, first of all, we've got to, as I said, we've got to watch for ourselves. Because if we fail, if we fall, we cannot protect those whom we are called to protect. The most obvious example of that is David. David fell victim. David, of course, in his sin with Bathsheba, fell victim to not a literal lion, but to the prowling lion, Satan himself. And while he obtained forgiveness, the consequences of his action never left his family or his kingdom in that. We cannot be oblivious to those dangers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, he said, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. He will get a foothold anywhere he can in our lives, through the eyes, through the ears, through the mind, through the affections, through friends, through family, through jobs, through recreation. He will do this wherever he can find a crack and a crev- crevice. He will Come. I remember years back when you used to have to pick up the Laterno students to bring them to church. Now they've got their own cars, so I don't have to do that anymore. And I used to have to drive out there through Lear Park. And I would drive through and there would be hundreds of people out there on a Sunday morning. No thought for God. No thought for the spiritual well-being of themselves or others. Out there, ignorantly, not giving any thought to the spiritual welfare of themselves or those children. Every one of them with a soul that is going to stand before God. And men, let me say this, we need to be watchful because every one that has been put under our care as heads of our homes, every one of them have a soul that is going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's either going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And how are we to watch? Well, Colossians 4 and 2 has a good Answer to that, he said, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Men, we begin with prayer. 
we begin and we stay in the Word and we stay in the church and we stay in the company of those that love the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he speaks of here, stand firm in the faith. As Christian men, we need to stand firm in our faith. We do not need to be as children tossed to and fro as Paul talks about over there in Ephesians 4 and 14 like children. But we need to be as men that are spiritually strong and growing in our faith. In Psalm 1, 1 through 3, he said, "Blessed, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And in his law he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever, in whatever he does, he prospers. Men, this is to be us. Not just the preachers. Not just the teachers. Every single Christian man is to be growing and standing firm in his faith. As men individually in our families, our churches, this kind of firmness, stability, and growth needs to be seen. And I'm thankful that we have a church full of men that are growing and have a hunger for the Word of God. And if you're not there, join in. Be in the Word. Every single day, you cannot get enough in a Sunday school lesson and the preaching on Sunday morning to last you through the week to the next week. You need to be in the Word every day or you are going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly and stand in the place of sinners. This is where we're to be. This kind of firmness is going to stand the test of times and trials and tribulations. Why do men leave their families? Because they're not standing in the things of God. They're not standing or meditating in the word of God. But they are standing in the counsel of the ungodly. And we're to put on this armor that we're going to get to... to here in a few verses in Ephesians chapter 6, but in chapter 6 of Ephesians verse 13, he says, Therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. He said, well, when is the evil day coming? I think it's pretty obvious we're in the evil day. We are surrounded by evil and wickedness, at least in my thinking I've lived Longer than most of you. There might be a couple out there that have lived, been around longer than me, but that we are living in perhaps maybe the most evil time that I've ever seen in my thinking. The things that I'm seeing now in our culture are things which I never dreamed that I would see. The sins that are not only downplayed, but openly celebrated in our culture. And I believe this, that it's because of the downgrading, the watering down of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I think that's why it's happened. But to stand firm, we've got to put on this armor of God. If we're going to resist in the evil day, we've got to put on this full armor of God. He gives several different pieces of the armor there, and it is the picture of a Roman soldier. And the Roman soldiers, was the be they were the best equipped soldiers in the world, and it is likely that this was a prison epistle. And so Paul is writing this, and he's probably chained to this Roman. Now what a blessing it was for that guy. He's chained to the Apostle Paul. I, I could have gone for some of that. But Paul is sitting there and he's looking at this Roman soldier and so he likens this armor of all Christians, but men, I'm talking to you this morning, of the armor that we need to be wearing, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, carrying the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, girded about with truth and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we put it on every, you say, well, how often do I put it on? Every single day. Because every single day that you go out, you're in warfare. If you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, there's no warfare. You're in with the enemy. 
But if you're a Christian, you're in warfare. You're in battle. You need the armor. You will only stand if you are wearing the armor of the Christian soldier. But we need here, as he talks about in this, and he said, what enables us to stand? And you notice that the last thing that I mentioned was your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now the Roman soldier, you know, they don't wear shoes like what we did, but they had these sandals that I'm told as I researched this, and they had little hobnails on the bottom of it that when they were standing and battling, it would grip into the ground and they would be able to stand as they were hit with the blows and as they were swinging their sword, they were able to stand. So what we need to be able to stand, the first thing is the gospel of peace. Now, some people think the idea is that the gospel is only for our salvation on the day of our salvation. That's the only time we need to hear the gospel. That's wrong. You need to preach the gospel to yourself every day. Every single day, you need to preach the gospel to yourself to remind you of who your Lord and Savior is, who it is you are battling for, who it is you're striving for, who it is you're living for to glorify, and who you're in in light of protecting your family, that this is the one that you are doing it in his name and for his honor and for his glory. The Roman soldiers, the Romans used to say, we're doing it for the glory of Rome. We're doing it for something else a whole lot better than the glory of Rome because the glory of Rome is gone. But the glory of the kingdom of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords is forever. This is what we battle for. This is what we are doing. Is standing for him and standing for our families. We look at 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you, which also you received and which also you stand. We stand in the gospel. When we celebrate this table today, after the service is over, we are celebrating, we are standing in the gospel because it proclaims the gospel, the broken body, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ declares the necessity of believing in the gospel and standing in the gospel every single day as children of God. We need to be reminded of that. Must be consistently preached. I remember Charles Spurgeon used to talk about that no matter what he preached on. When he got to the end of his sermon, he said, I'm going to, we, we circle around back to the gospel because we need to remember the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to saturate our minds and our lives with the truth of God's word and the power of the gospel. All Christian men need to be men of the word, men of the gospel, men of righteousness. Again, it's not just for a select few, it is for all of them. To neglect prayer, to neglect the word, to neglect the church is inviting and opening a doorway to slip or fall because we are not standing firmly in our faith. Do not in your pride think that you cannot fall. We've been reminded very recently of even those that we think are above falling can fall. You and I can fall if we don't stand in the gospel. If we don't clothe ourselves with the armor of Christ. Paul said a little further back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, therefore let, him who th- let, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. And what a great testimony it is to see in a church men standing firmly in the faith. Do not take that for granted. Do not take that for granted. David said in Psalm 56 and verse 13, For you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. 
Make no mistake about it. It is not your grit and your determination, but it is in the power and the strength of God and the Holy Spirit and the protection of the Word of God being saturated into your mind and your heart and staying upon your knees in prayer and being in the church where the gospel is preached over and over and over again. This is how you stand. This is how you find firmness in your faith, man. Then thirdly, Act like men. <laughs> I think in the old King James Version, it, it, used to, it says, quit you like men. I was always, when I was younger, I was thinking, what does that mean? Quit you like men. Now, I love, let me say this, I love the King James Version. But sometimes it can be a little archaic in the language. It's difficult to understand. It literally means, act like men, be manly. The phrase here, when translated from the Greek to the English, Loses something, as it so often does. And so it doesn't give enough emphasis to what Paul is saying here. It really means be men constantly or show yourselves men always. Now, if you want to know something that's really under attack in this day and time, it is masculinity. I don't know if you've heard the phrase or not, but you hear this used out there, toxic masculinity which is an abhorrent phrase. What is toxic is the disparaging of biblical masculinity, of saying that there is something wrong with how God has created us to be. Let me make this very clear. God, in his sovereignty, did not make a mistake with any of you. He created you to be what you are, Male and female and in your personalities. Sometimes I know we say, oh, I wish I was taller. I wish I was not so round. (laughs) I wish I was smarter. But God has given us all distinctive gifts and talents to be used for His honor and glory in the work of God. And so... In this phrase, what we have here, be manly, is the connotation that of men with an unfailing and unflinching bravery and courage in every realm. I believe this, that there is a thing such as spiritual bravery that transcends anything in the physical world. Now, there are are great acts of bravery that I could call to mind of Christian men. I just happen to think one of my favorite movies is a way old one. It's one about Sergeant York. Uh, okay, somebody, somebody's seen that movie besides me. A stalwart Christian man played by one of my favorite actors, Gary Cooper. I'll just throw that in there. <laughs> and he struggled with going to war because of the Bible saying, thou shalt not kill. Now we understand that means thou shalt not murder. And he struggled with that, but he eventually submitted to that. And he, in that movie, saves hundreds of lives and captures many enemies by being manly in his demeanor. But he never gave up his convictions about the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we are called to do great physical things as men that are brave. We've already talked about David, that those things that he did were brave, grabbing a lion by the beard and slaying it or a bear. You think about Abraham that I mentioned a little while ago. What did he do? He heard that his his nephew Lot had been captured. And he says, okay, servants, come on. We're going to form an army or a posse and we're going to go rescue him. And they did and they went and rescued them. A very manly thing to do. We think about Moses. Who at first when God called him, he was afraid. But, I, but God gave him courage and he stood before Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And eventually, guess what happened? Not because of Moses' bravery, but God in his strength and his power, the people were delivered. But Moses stood up like a man. I think about Daniel that stood for obedience to God, was thrown into a den of lions. Now, if you don't think that that's being manly and brave and courageous, let's try it sometime. He was delivered. 
And I think of those that were not delivered. I think of all the ones as martyrs who were men. Like Latimer and Ridley and Polycarp that died at the stake burning for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were courageous men that stood. Their testimony lives until this day. We need to recognize that our strength, men, our Spiritual manliness and courage is alone from the Lord. In Psalm 27 and 1, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strong defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? If God, if we know that God is standing with us, we can be and should be courageous. What can they do to us besides deliver us to heaven in that? No ten thousands, David said, surround me. I will not fear. Why? Because God is his shield and defender. He is the strength. Psalm 31 and 24, he said, Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for Yahweh. We have bravery and courage, men, because of our confidence in his strength and the weaponry which God alone provides for the believer. We also are to be manly because we know the weapons that we have. That they are not of ourselves. That they are not physical weapons, but they are the weapons of God. For the weapons of our warfare, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the tearing down of strongholds. Sometimes we come against strongholds. Spiritual strongholds. There are spiritual Wickedness in the heavenlies, we are told in Ephesians 6. Not of this world, principalities and powers of darkness that war against us. You're not going to be able to stand against those with your own resolve, your own determination. But when you take the sword of the Spirit of the Word of God, that is a weapon that will defeat Satan every time. This is what we have. And we see the contrast in the scriptures of those who had no courage and those who did. I mentioned Caleb a little while ago and Joshua. I'm not going to turn to it now, but in Numbers 13, if you remember, Israel sent 12 spies into the land before they entered in. And they came back and they said, oh yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but we can't defeat them, 10 of them said. Because they are great in the land. And they cried out and tried to cry out and they cried out against Moses and we're going to return to Egypt. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb, had this courage, this manliness in God. They had that faith in God that God would defeat the enemies. And they were preserved for those 40 years. The rest of them dropped dead in the wilderness. But what we find, we read the scripture this morning of Joshua 1, 1 through 9. And then later on, there are, if you know the passage of scripture in the last chapter of Joshua, Joshua says, it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need men, we need you to say, it's for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to stand against the enemy. But over there in in, in in Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, when they got there and Caleb and they were about to enter the land and he says, let me tell you something, guys. I was 40 years old when we started wandering in the wilderness and I said we could take this land and now I'm 85 and I'm just as strong as I've ever been and I'm going to go in and I'm going to take the land by God's help. This is the way that we need to be. We may be more infirmed in body. I'm not the same guy at 68 Mm. (laughs) as 28. But to borrow a phrase, by God's strength and by God's power, I can be all that he can make me to be. This This is the boldness that we're to have to be men for God, to expect great things from God, as William Carey said, and attempt great things for God. You'll never do anything for God if you think, I can't do it. But our strength, our manliness, our firmness is not in ourselves. It is in the God of this Bible who has promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. 
What he has commanded, he will strengthen us to do. I want this to be a church full of strong and manly men that believe in the promises of the scripture and will war, fight war and declare war against the enemy. Jesus Christ has said that the gates of hell are going to come against the church, but they're not going to prevail. Guess what, guys? I've seen the end of the book. We don't lose. We win. And we should be going out as conquering men for our families and for our Lord. And I look, I think of other examples in the scripture. I see Stephen who in manliness and in courage preached the word of God to, until his death in Acts 7. We see Peter and John when the Sanhedrin court says, well, you've got to stop preaching that Jesus. They say, well, I don't care. You guys... Whatever you tell us, we cannot help but preach and declare the things which we have seen and heard and preach Christ. For there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. There are people in this world today, we live in this bubble of the United States of America. Oh, aren't we so glad that we have the freedom to preach the gospel without fear of any kind of persecution? I'm not sure that's been for our betterment because we have brothers and sisters across the globe, China, Russia, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, that are giving their lives to preach and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we see manliness. Be strong, he says then. Act like men. Be strong. It means strength and action. It speaks of the might and the power and the dominion which comes from the Spirit of God that we've talked about over here in Ephesians chapter 3. Now over there in verse 16, he says, be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. This is what we need. We need to be strengthened by the Spirit of God. And this strength, I believe, is given to those who are earnestly contending for the faith. And in earnestly contending for the faith, we are earnestly contending, men, for our homes and our families. Jude 3 says, exhorting that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. We have lived for too long in this nation in the lap of luxuriant Christianity. Of no cost Christianity, we've told people, oh, just name it and claim it for Jesus. And there's no persecution associated with it. But the scripture says all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's something wrong with that message that they preach and the message that Paul preached and Jesus preached. I believe this, that God will supply the strength needed for the battle that's ahead of us. Because... Pardon me for saying this. No political person is going to change all of that. Now, I do believe in godly leadership. I believe in leadership that respects the rule of law. That's as close to a political statement as I'll get. But those are not going to solve the problems of this nation. And I fear we're not going back. I fear that what has been set in place is going to be here. And that there's going to be a very clear dividing line between those that will stand for the truth and those that will not. It's already, we're already seeing it in our nation. But I believe that God will supply the strength needed for this battle. And for men, this battle is in our own lives, for the spiritual lives of our wives and our children, for their souls. Let me ask you this. Let me say this, men. Do you not see them as worthy of you battling, of you striving, of you putting on the armor, of you picking up the sword and doing war against the enemy? Do you not see that God has sovereignly and by design put you in this place? It is not accidental that you're married to that woman that is sitting next to you. Mine's in the pew around here. It is not accidental 
It is sovereign. It is by God's providence. It is by God's design. And that those children that God has given to you, whether they're two or four or six or eight or however many, if you've got a quiver, which is 12, by the way, <laughs> that they have been given to you. And they are worthy of you standing up as a Christian man and being strong in the power and the might of the Spirit of God. To battle and war for their souls. And I believe when you do that, then you will stand before God one day and He will say to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you're going to say, Well, sometimes the battle's hard, brother David. Yeah, it sure is. War is hard, but He gives strength. Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31, he gives power to the weary. To him who lacks vigor, he increases might. Though youths grow weary and tired and choice young men stumble badly, yet those who hope in Yahweh will gain new power. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Your strength may be spent at the end of the day, but guess what? When you get up in the morning and you ask God to give you strength, He will give you strength for that day. He will give you power for that day to do what He has called you to do. You're going to get weary in the battle. But there is an unending supply of His might, His Spirit to those who are valiant for the truth, their families, their church, their Lord. John Gill said this, Trust in His power, whose arm is not shortened, depend on His grace, which is always sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, My grace is sufficient for you. That wasn't just for Paul. That's for every single believer. He will give us that strength and that grace that we need to care for our families, to stand against Satan. The battle is the Lord's. The victory is the Lord's. The strength for the battle is His strength. We put on the armor, we go out into the battle, but we go out in the confidence of His strength. And we go out without fear of the enemy. What can they do to us? And then lastly, he says here, be always loving or do all in love. Sometimes, as men, we think it's unmanly to show love. Ooh, you want me to show affection? Ooh. <laughs> now, I don't have a problem with that. You can ask my wife, she t- she'll tell you, or my children, that I'm an affectionate guy. But as men, we're to love our wives and our children in the love of Christ. The word there is agape, which is holy love. And we've already talked about this in Ephesians 5 and 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for it. We are to give, we are to love in such a way that is sacrificial even to our very lives. We protect and we provide for those God has given to us because we love them. We provide and protect those put under our care spiritually because of the agape love that God has implanted deep within our souls. Because you see, if God loves us, if we are His children and He loves us, that love is deep within our souls. And we are loving them not just with a natural human affection, but we are loving them with the love of Christ is what we're loving them. And the Apostle Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, above all, keep fervent... Fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And men, our families know we're not perfect. We're going we're gonna to mess up sometimes. We're going to stub our toes. But there's forgiveness with God. And He calls us to be men for the sake of His name, to stand firm in the faith for His name, to act like men for His name, to be strong in the might of the Lord for His name and for the sake of our families. 
And so what all of this has preceded springs from our love for the Lord Jesus Christ and then for our families and then for our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we don't watch, if we do not endeavor to stand in the faith, if I'm not striving to be manly, if I'm not strong, it's going to, there's going to be repercussions. There's going to be consequences. There's always consequences for everything, especially disobedience. There's going to be consequences. I believe this in this particular day and time that the stakes are too high to ignore what Paul instructs us from God's Word. So men, let's be men of God and stand firm in the faith and be strong for the glory of God and for the protection of our families and our homes. May we pray.